Jeff, Zach, thanks for joining me. Hey, hey Steve. All right, so a bit of an alarming headline here. Um, commercial property distress in the U.S. is at a 10-year high. Um, we've seen the value of distressed commercial real estate uh, near $80 billion in the third quarter. That's the highest level in a dec decade. Um, office buildings have, have really kind of led the way here. Um, office properties accounted for 41% of that nearly $80 billion uh, total. Um, you know, that comes with some issues with tenancy. Um, remote work's been cited a lot, but we've also saw, seen multifamily um, playing a role here. Um, a fair amount of those um, assets in the mix. Uh, and we've seen, you know, obviously the, the value fall in commercial property values about 9% in the year through September um, down. Um, total transactions down by about 53%. And so uh, while we are seeing higher levels of distress, I mean, that is less than what we saw around the uh, Great Recession. Um, but um, MSCI that was providing a lot of this data also pointed out that we've got uh, another 215 billion of potentially troubled assets out there. Um, your thoughts um, as industry veterans when we look at the growing uh, distress in in the market, particularly a few segments of the market. Well, I'm going to uh, jump off here. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to say uh, two things. You know, one, they're saying it's not as bad as the Great Recession. I would caveat that by saying yet. Um, I'm personally seeing, uh, you know, Jeff, I'm sure you're seeing some of the same stuff and, and our viewers probably are experiencing this, whether they know it or not, but I'm seeing 20 and 25% economic vacancies built into a lot of the deals that are coming across my desk that we're passing on right now. Um, but one of the major hammers, and it's not even like a small hammer, it's more like a sledgehammer, uh, that I'm seeing is it's not just office, it, it's multifamily too. Um, a lot of loans are maturing and the interest rates are so high, they're restrictive in terms of the cash flow being able to support the debt. And even when they're not, for example, this is an, something that hit close to home today. I was looking at a deal, uh, someone in 2019, pre-COVID, they sourced a $5 million loan. Um, they're selling a piece of property with uh, 15 years left on that loan out of 20. It's a fixed rate at 4.48%. Sounds pretty good. The debt service is $295,000 a year. The income on the property is $320,000 a year. They are one hiccup away of not being able to afford their debt service, and they can't refinance from a 4.5% to an 8% interest rate. So I think the other shoe is yet to, to drop, and I think the distress is a lot greater than what people are seeing, and I think it is directly related to interest rates. And really quickly, just uh, the uh, MISCI data there was showing, um, to your point, that a good chunk of this is also um, multifamily out there. Well, That's yeah, I mean, you, you, you got oh, is that I mean, about a third, um, according to their data, that risk properties were multifamily. Yeah, you know, I, I'd probably add to that. You know, it's interesting when you look at, you know, Zach kind of named, you know, one particular deal, but you know, for a while I was going to multifamily um, essentially events and trying to figure out how people were buying it, two and three caps, trying to figure, you know, and the only thing I got it was response. If you don't understand it, you know, we're, we're able to increase ancillary income. Well, ancillary income doesn't make up on a two or 3% cap rate, doesn't increase that much. And you, you can't get annual escalation significant enough to offset a three cap with your, your debt at four and a half percent. Just doesn't hey, make sense. Let me translate that for a few folks out there. <laughs> um, when interest rates were really, really low, um, people structured some deals on the assumption that interest rates were going to stay really, really, really low, and they're no longer really, really low. And those types of deals that were modeled that aggressively um, now just don't work on paper. Um, go on there, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, and then then add to it. There's there's a number of people that were you know, were buying these assets doesn't matter when i say assets i mean multifamily office everything we're buying them on short term bridge debt that you know they were they were betting on rates staying low and now rates have jumped up significantly they can't get through their construction period where they're still at variable rates their money anyway, no longer works time time out guys for one second because i uh, think we're shit, scaring I, the crap I, out of the viewers Right. We just bought a uh, a piece of property that's multifamily and we used a bridge loan to get to our GSC stabilized loan. I don't want to say all deals are bad and I don't want to scare people 
what we're doing and, and what separates us from the rest of the pack is we're better or i'd like to think that we're better at analyzing deals and uncovering and unearthing deals that um the metrics work the it's returns the bridge work. debt coming we can we can support the debt we can actually figure these things out where other people can't and that's that's part of what separates us from the pack and and shows our success because we're finding these deals that we can take bridge debt still afford that debt get to a, a permanent loan we can increase value people did not see this this uh, diamond in the rough. We did, and we were able to capitalize on it when other people couldn't. So I don't want to scare everybody because th there are deals that still exist that are good deals, and we're finding those. There's a great Warren Buffett quote that when the tide comes in, you find out who's been swimming naked. And and I think that's <laughs> that's that's really what we're talking about here is that when rates were low, it was kind of hard to tell who was doing good deals, who was doing bad deals because the the low financing costs. Um, allowed uh, those bad deals to kind of get hidden and be able to keep 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 being out there. But once the tide came in, once all of a sudden all that liquidity, all that cheap money wasn't there, now the deals that weren't structured so well, now now the folks that were just trying to push this stuff out and make their money and not really care how well it was structured, now you're finding out which ones those are. And, and unfortunately, um, there there's a considerable number out there, and I, I think we all agree that. Um, we, we've got some, uh, the industry is going to have some challenges as it works through some of these bad deals. Um, but there's a lot of good deals out there too. Um, but we're, we're not to find out the difference between the two. Well, it kind of, actually this kind of ironically reminds me of the, uh, from the 08 side, you know, when you had taxi drivers buying million, $2 million properties and trying to flip them in, you know, 30, 60, you know, 90 days for your, for a million dollar profit. I mean, it, it's it's not the same, but it's somewhat similar from guys who probably shouldn't have been looking at, you know, multifamily deals, trying to figure out a way to flip them off the ancillary income or, or very modest increases to uh, to rental rates. All right. Well, we are definitely going to be, uh, unfortunately, talking more about this topic. I think we all agree that um, the the bad deals, the deals that were done that shouldn't have been done. Um, are going to be um, causing some more problems going forward. And I think this is going to be a topic we'll be talking more about. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve.